Greetings and welcome to Church Online. As we meet together, we acknowledge the original custodians on the lands where each of us are at this moment. May we walk gently and respectfully on the land. My name is Lynn, I'm the Minister at Adelaide West, and it's a privilege to be sharing with you today. As we meet together, we light a candle. It reminds us that Jesus is the light of the world and present with us as we meet together in this way. After the message today, we'll be sharing communion. So you might like to have some juice and some bread on hand for that. We worship together how great God is, how great thou art. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart.
from Mark chapter 3, verses 20 to 35. Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, He is out of his mind. And the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, He is possessed by Beelzebul, by the prince of demons. He is driving out demons. So Jesus called them over to him and began to speak to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. Truly I tell you, people can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. He said this because they were saying, He has an impure spirit. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting round him, and they told him, Your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers? he asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle round him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my mother, brother and sister. From 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 13 to chapter 5, verse 1. It is written, I believed, therefore I have spoken. Since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. All this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart, Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Where is home? Is it where you live? Where you grew up? Is it with your family? Or are you still searching for home? I wasn't really sure where home was as a child. I lived in many homes, about 18 by the time I was 20, across two states and two countries. The longest was in Belgium, where we lived for three years. Home was a bit complicated. Family was somewhat dysfunctional, and it wasn't a particularly happy place for me. So I'm not sure it was home. It was where I lived, but was it home? For some of us, home is with family. And here in the Mark passage, we have some complicated relationships with family, and some of us can relate to that. Jesus enters a house. It's so crowded that he and his disciples can't even eat. Some of his family arrive and are concerned that he's out of his mind, beside himself, and they try to take charge of him. It was common at the time for family to hide behaviour from family members that could bring shame on the family. Then Mark seems to park that story and start another one. Religious authorities, scribes, arrive from Jerusalem. It's a bit surprising and a bit dramatic that they've come to a regional town. They're clearly 
concerned. Word has got around and Jesus is creating division in the house. He's becoming a problem for them. They set up a press conference outside the house to damage his reputation. After all, he's not accredited. He didn't attend rabbi college. Who is this upstart speaker? He's clearly causing problems for them, so they state that he's using demonic powers. He is not of God. It's all about authority. Where does the authority of Jesus come from? This is early in the ministry of Jesus. He has called his disciples, appointed the twelve. He's healed a number of people, someone with an unclean spirit, many at Simon's house, a leper, a paralyzed man, and someone with a withered hand and on a Sabbath. He's done a preaching tour in Galilee and people were starting to come to hear him from all over Judea, Jerusalem and beyond. And we're only up to chapter 3 in Mark. No wonder the scribes were alarmed. Who is this man and whose is his authority? Where is home for Jesus? And Jesus knows this and so he answers them in parables, a parallel story as he often does. He points out the flaw in their thinking. If Satan were to cast out Satan, then he's fighting against himself. If civil war breaks out in a country, we know that the country is divided. It is not strong. It is weak. Or if a household fights amongst themselves, it is not a strong household. And for some, that is the end of the family unit. So if the devil is fighting the devil, he will meet his end. Jesus tells them that evil will be bound up. Evil will be disempowered as Jesus is the stronger one. The healings of Jesus are signs that God's kingdom is indeed arriving, where people who have been held captive will be set free. And then we come across a somewhat awkward talk about blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, a sin that cannot be forgiven. The scribes are attributing Jesus' ministry as demonic. Of the devil not holy, that is blasphemy. God is mercy and they're rejecting God's mercy and goodness. That is blasphemy. And while they continue to believe that, they are not forgiven. If you don't accept forgiveness, you don't have it. And then Mark takes us back to the family again. His mother and his brothers have arrived and here we have a Q&A on who exactly is the family of Jesus. When he hears of their arrival, he makes this startling statement. Who are my mother and my brothers? Whoever does God's will is my brother and my sister and mother. This is scandalous at the time and would still be in some places today. The family bond was tight and long lasting. Unlike today, where our son lives in Darwin and our daughter in Sydney, it was normal for children to live close to their parents, sometimes in the same house. And the family unit was often the business unit. They worked together, shared everything in common. Loyalty to family was the outworking of the loyalty of Israel as the people of God. So break this link and you're pulling out the carpet from under their feet. Jews couldn't understand this way of thinking. Once again, Jesus challenges the symbols at the heart of Jewish identity. God is starting a new family, a new identity, a new holy people and doing so without regard for the ordinary family bonds. Perhaps. This is speaking into where is home for Jesus. We know that the family of Jesus did acknowledge the ministry and authority of Jesus later. And as Jesus was dying on the cross, he told John, an apostle, uh, an apostle his much-loved friend, to care for his mother, Mary, who was standing by the cross as he died. And his brother James became a leader of the church in Jerusalem. But Jesus isn't being nice here, with family or the authorities. You're supposed to be nice when the officials visit from the home office or when the family come to stay. There's a struggle. And I like the concept that the good news, the gospel, is available in 
that struggle. And in 2 Corinthians 4, we see a sense of that. We do not lose heart. We are renewed day by day, even though outwardly we are wasting away. I've been even more aware of this since having major surgery six weeks ago. My body is not able to do the things I could do before. I hope to in months to come. But it's a reminder that there are limits to what we do. And so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, what is unseen is eternal. Our bodies are temporary. Our lives here on earth are temporary. Some of us have been here temporarily longer than others. We're reminded each time we go to a funeral that we are not around forever. You know, we go to school temporarily. It feels like forever, however you experience it. I started school at five and finished a few months shy of turning 17. It was a bit complicated. Seven schools, two states, two countries, two languages, educational systems that just weren't the same. And yet it felt like it was permanent, that this was going on and on for a long time. But it was temporary. And then we had the next season of school, almost 16 years, this time as parents of school kids. I assume we've all had a school experience. We all went to school. And many of us have had another experience as parents, aunts, uncles, godparents or grandparents. Some of us have taken this temporary thing to a whole new level and made a vocation out of it as teachers or school staff. Temporary has been a bit longer, but it's still temporary. Change in vocation or retirement comes, and one eventually leaves school. There's a real sense of temporary here in these passages. Perhaps it speaks to us about where home is for us. I wonder if home is a place of belonging, where you most belong, where you can be yourself and be loved for it. Perhaps home is being where you are with someone, a partner, friends or family. Home is also a place of becoming, where we are growing as people, where we can be who we are and become who we're meant to be, a place where we flourish. And it's also a place where we give back and where we bless others. And while we're on this earth, this home is temporary. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands, from 2 Corinthians 5. You know, one day we will truly be home. I I don't know what heaven is like. We have glimpses of it in the scriptures, but we really don't know what is metaphor and what is not. But one thing we do know, it is a place without suffering. You know, some of us live with chronic pain, pain that's always there in some form, either constantly or lurking, ready for when you do something, perhaps something ordinary, and then bang, there it is, pain. Have that now as I recover from surgery, but this will pass. Others have this all the time. You know, heaven is a place without pain. That's where there'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, as we read in Revelation. We can think of heaven as a place with no messiness in life, where there's no hunger or poverty, where people are in harmony together, no sadness, struggle or tears, where we actually see Jesus, walk with Jesus, feel and know his love in a whole new way, where God dwells with us, where all things are made new. I see it as a place of peace love, community and worship. Perhaps, perhaps this is truly home. This is the unseen that is eternal. So where is home for you now whilst here on earth? I wonder if home is when we are with Jesus. It's the place where we can be who we are and become who we are created to be. Home is being with Jesus, belonging to Jesus, being in relationship with Jesus where we are renewed every day. Home is living with Jesus. Amen. i
stone is solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. joy it is to be able to share communion in this way together. Communion is a visible sign of God's love and grace. And those of us who desire to live more fully in the spirit of grace and the call to fruitfulness, we come, we come hungry for this feast. We are virtually connected, a gathered community connected by time and participating together for us now and with Christians across the world. We remember as we come how it all began. On the night when Jesus was betrayed by a friend, he sat at supper with his disciples and while they were eating, he took a piece of bread, said a blessing, broke it and shared it among them. And then he took and blessed and passed around a cup of wine from which they all drank. A body broken, a life poured out. In our remembering, we are awoken. And so now following Jesus' example, we take this bread and this wine, which the Spirit blesses. And as Jesus gave thanks before sharing, let us do so too. Let's pray. Lord God, in this time and place, you prepare a table offering not just bread or wine, but your very presence, that we may be filled, forgiven, encouraged, and sent out again. Thank you that we find home in you, that place where we can be ourselves and become the people that you call us to be. Risen Christ, present with us now, we give you thanks for all that you have done for us. We're sorry for those times where we miss the mark, where we don't draw near to you, 
when we don't think of you as home. Forgive us for when we separate ourselves from you or from others. And thank you that these things and all our sins are forgiven. In the name of Jesus, through Jesus' death on the cross for each of us. And Lord Jesus, we say thank you. We honour you and we give you glory. Holy God, pour out your spirit upon us and on these gifts of bread and wine before each of us that they may be for us a reminder of the body, body and blood of Christ, so that united to Jesus, we may become all that we are called to be. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honour is yours. Amen. I invite you to join me as we say the Lord's Prayer together and you can do that in your preferred language or in your preferred um, version. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. I encourage you to take the bread and to tear it apart. The bread we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. The cup we take is a sharing in the blood of Christ, reminding us of the life of of Christ. Here at this table of bread and cup, graced by the spirit of hope and peace, we discover the wonderful love that Jesus has for each of us. The home that we can find when we come to Jesus. And we rejoice that these are the gifts of God for us, the people of God. I invite you to take and to eat the bread, share it around with others in the room if you're with others. And remember, Jesus' body broken and his amazing love for us. And we take the cup, remembering the life that Jesus lived and the life that we are called to live. Let's drink together. As a scattered community today, may we be a sign of hope and faith united in community together. And as part of our love for God and our love and compassion for others, Let's pause now to pray for our world. Arawada Tanaha, Nagapala, Nukathana, God our Most High, our Maker. We continue to pray for areas in our world today under hardship, struggling due to war or famine or oppression. We remember the hot COVID hotspots in our world areas in South America, India, parts of Europe. We pray for a vaccine to be rolled out for all people in all nations. We pray for our communities. Lord Jesus, we remember uh, Victoria at this time, continuing their lockdown. And we pray for them, for patience and resilience and that they would be able to stop the spread. And we continue to pray for those areas <clears throat> in Australia where the mice plagues are at their worst. We pray that the cold weather that we've experienced just over this last week would help to bring an end to those plagues. And as we do each week, we bring those we know and love to you, those who have no home, those that feel 
heavy under the weight of the struggle of life, grieving health. We pray for them. We ask that your peace, your joy and love would surround them at this time. Loving God, what a privilege it is to be in prayer. We thank you that you hear our prayers. We offer them in the name of Jesus. We offer them together. And we offer them knowing that your love and your peace is there for all of us. In the name of Jesus. Amen. joining us today we pray that you've experienced hope as we've shared together in this way we continue 
to bring our offerings, our giving. And we dedicate our financial and our practical giving as a witness to God's great love. If you would like prayer, please press the prayer button if you're watching live or send us an email. Where is home for you? Draw near to Jesus. Experience home with Jesus. Belong to Jesus. Experience the beauty of relationship in Jesus. And know that we are renewed each and every day. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship, unity and friendship of the Holy Spirit be with you today and remain with you always. Amen. Blessings on your week.